Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser coming to you live from the Hauser Neck Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, I thank you for watching this video. I would ask those of you get the, these videos to watch this video all the way through. So I'm gonna, it's gonna be basically me unedited and there's so many important things I have to say today and we're not going to have a time limit. So I don't know if this video on long haul COVID is going to be a half an hour or maybe two hours. So I'm just going to talk a lot. There is a lot of slides and we all know that COVID has affected everybody, basically everybody in the world. So it's very, very important uh, for all of us to learn about COVID and especially what can happen uh, long term possibly uh, related to COVID. But I am gonna start out first of just sharing some of my own heart. So prior to even making this video, I did have a time of crying. So if I end up crying at, on this video, we're just gonna let it roll. So uh, the, you know, you might see me on the video and oh, the doctor is so joyous and all so happy. In reality, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. Uh, my associate, Danielle, that's been my associate for 10 years, who's the other prolotherapist here at Caring Medical, she basically almost died, kind of, and her she was pregnant with twins, so she's pregnant with twins. Then about one month ago, she was in the hospital, and basically in the hospital in the middle of the night, she basically had to catch one of her twins. She had to basically catch one of her twins then basically one of the placentas abrupted from the uterus and she was bleeding and thank God she was in the hospital. So this was like a month ago. So there was an emergency and then baby Brooklyn, the one, the baby that she caught, well obviously when she catches the baby, the baby's not breathing because the baby's only there at 25 weeks. And then, so that was a whole thing to keep her alive and then baby Austin was still in there and he had to be born by C-section. So the caring medical family here in uh, Fort Myers, Florida for the last month has been praying diligently for Danielle, for Tom, for Tom, uh, Danielle's husband, who's a, who's, a, who's a good friend of mine. So then, uh, then uh, we are, we've we been praying for baby Brooklyn and baby Austin. So I'm gonna lead because you're part of caring, you're part of the caring medical family if you're getting this. So let's all unite together and pray for them. And the caring medical family and me specifically would ask that you would continue to pray for them. So, uh, dear God, we do thank you that baby Brooklyn and baby Austin are alive. Thank you that the hospital has given such good care for them. And thank you for Danielle and Tom. And you know they're just getting worn out. They're so tired and they have two young children, baby uh, Connor and uh, baby Gabby at home, which are only three and one. So there's so many people that have been helping them. Thank you for all their relatives and all the staff here and all the patients that have been praying. And we just pray that you give them strength, give them your grace, surround them by your love we pray, Lord, that you keep the babies alive, that you would keep them uh, growing, that you would give them enough oxygen, that the babies would know that their parents love them, that the staff loves them, and that you love them. And we just pray that you would protect them. Like the Bible says that uh, the babies have angels in heaven, that they have guardian angels. We pray that the spiritual forces at work would protect them and guide them and guide the staff and uh, then the whole staff here we just pray your protection on them as, as we're all tired just trying to do everything we need to do to give the good patient care here while she's gone and this important video we just pray that the words that I say that they would go up forth and just uh, speak truth and it would help a lot a lot of people we love you in your name I pray amen so I just have this here uh, 
I have this here because my staff's so awesome. So Graceland gave me this. I, I mean, my staff just knows I'm working so hard because I'm now seeing her patients and my patients. So, I, uh, you know, so I just thank you, Graceland. Even just, you know, she got these for me. So I'm gonna give these back there. And then the patients that over the last month have been so gracious, you know, there's times where I've been running, you know, one to two hours behind and the patients have just been unbelievable knowing that, you know, Dr. Hauser's working as hard as he can. So I'm just going to read part of a letter from Joanne. She said, this is on 331.22, Dear Dr. Hauser, I appreciate you accepting me as a patient and your entire treatment plan for me. It sounds awesome. You know, and I thank you for a generous gift that I gave her. So I gave her some, uh, you know, a book and different things that, that I think would be helpful to her. I truly believe that your services are going to really help my body to heal. God bless you throughout your life. So, you know, all these things are really, really helpful. And I think I, if all of us would just say thank you more, it would go a long way. And thank you is one of the main words that I use to my staff, like they hand me syringes, right? I don't have to say thank you to them, but you can't hear thank you enough. Like thank you means I appreciate you, I care about you, I affirm you. So let's just all make sure that we're saying thank you enough. And then I'm gonna say thank you to Will. So Izzy, this is your son's what Mickey Pointer. So I wanna thank Will, who's how old's Will? Seven. He's seven, so that's Izzy's oldest. So. Oh, it's Max? Yeah. Okay, so it's Max. So He's Max, how old? Three. No, so imagine the three-year-old gave me his Mickey pointer. Now, Izzy did this because she says I monkey up the, the, the TV here by touching. So, I'll, I'm, so here, I'll use the Mickey pointer. I just want to explain this because this, this is going to be the start of the long-haul COVID uh, talk. And you see here dynamic structural medicine the term dynamic structural medicine. And you might say, well, what does dynamic structural medicine have anything to do with long haul COVID? Well, by the end of this talk, you're gonna, I'm gonna give you a lot of new ideas of what possibly is going on with who got sick with COVID more than somebody else and um, who might be prone to getting long haul COVID symptoms. And you'll be shocked to learn that it may have more to do with the structure of, of the person's neck than it actually has to do with any chemical thing. So, uh, so what I wanna next do is just talk about natural medicine. So throughout my whole career, I've considered myself a natural medicine doctor. And my learning and my treating patients over the course of the last 34 years, so realize I was, I graduated medical school in 1988 from the University of Illinois. Great university, got a great education there. So basically I've been a physician for 34 years. And then anybody who knows me knows I like to work. Like, like when I'm in the office, I want boom, 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 boom. So for 34 years when I've been working, I've been in private practice since 1992. So basically June of this year will be my 30 year anniversary of being in true private practice where I'm the owner of the clinic and I can see as many patients as I want and I can have the staff I want. So I'm, if in a lot of ways, I'm like an old fashioned physician because I took over the practice of Gustav Hemwall who was born in 1908. He was 85 when I joined him in 1993. So realize like he was a physician before MRIs, before sophisticated diagnostics. So I was trained in primarily relying on the history like what somebody said and the little clues in talking to the person, looking them in the eye and figuring out what's wrong. So that's where my diagnostic skills are now. We live in 2022, so obviously we have MRIs, we have ultrasounds, we have all this stuff. But most of the time I could figure out what was wrong with a person just by talking to them. 
So we're gonna talk today, yeah, about long haul COVID, but we're mostly gonna talk about how to, how to figure out what's wrong and what to do about it and uh, how what you say has a role in how sick you are or how healthy you are, what you see, what you hear, what you think. And so natural medicine by definition is that it's kind of like there's an assumption that God made the body, you know, God made the human body, the human machine to repair itself. It just is. Like even if you have a bacterial infection or a viral infection, it's basically your own immune system that ultimately is gonna heal you. And you only need to use medicine or you only need to go to the doctor very, very rarely. If you, if you nurture the human body with the things that you need. So we know the main thing that the human body needs, it isn't food, it's actually love. Like that, that's the number one thing we all need, it's love. Like we need to feel loved and then we need to give love. You take any person who feels abandoned or feels fearful or doesn't feel loved or doesn't feel safe, right? Because one of the things I prayed for baby Brooklyn and baby Austin was feel love, feel love, feel love. Well, the way the NICU is there, Tom and Danielle, because they have twins there, they're, they're across the hall from each other. Well, they'll go in there and they'll put their finger in, in the incubator thing where they are and then the baby will hold their finger. And you just know the baby knows that mom and dad are there. And they told them that early on when they were first there in the, in the NICU, neonatal intensive care unit, they told them, basically, the more you're there, the greater the survival of the infants. So if you're Tom and Danielle, Tom's taken a leave of absence, he's an IRS agent, and then we've given Danielle basically an extended leave of absence. So if you're them, so they're there from eight to four, then they come home, be with their other kids, then seven to nine, they're back in the intensive care unit. And you could totally tell when they're talking to them talking to the babies, mommy loves you, you're doing amazing. Like you could just tell even on the monitor, like they're getting it. Like they know that their mom and dad loves them. So all of us need to make sure that we're doing our part to feel love, experience love, and to give love. And if you said, and I've told this to many patients, what do I consider a successful year? Like, in other words, every year at the beginning of the year, what I feel is a successful year is not how many prolotherapy patients I have, how many YouTube uh, subscribers we have, is that am I more loving at the end of the year than the beginning of the year? So if at the end of the year I'm more tolerant, I'm kinder, I'm more patient, I don't get upset, as much if somebody doesn't like me and I'm more loving toward them, then that's a successful year. And the reason why Jesus said that you should pray for your enemies, that you should do good to those who prosecute you or are mean to you is because anybody who prays for people that somebody would consider their enemy or that are mean to them. The reason why you pray for them is what happens when you start praying for somebody, you start loving them. It's literally impossible to pray for somebody. So let's just say that somebody doesn't like Dr. Hauser, so I'll just call the person's name Joe. No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an example. Uh, so an example would be that Marianne shared something with my parents because they're staying with us over the winter, then that somebody was upset with us, okay? So my dad's initial reaction is vengeance is mine, like, you know, just do something mean to them. And I said, no, that isn't the Christian way. The Christian way is to pray for them. So right then and there, I said, Dear God, we pray, I pray for Joe that you would surround him with love, that he would experience love, that he would get financial blessing, and that he would know that you love them, 
and that uh, your blessing would be upon him. <laughs> my dad looks at me and says, man, you are a better man than me. You know, my own father, like you're a better man than me. But you see, there, you can only, you, there's only one of two ways that all of us can go. We either go the way of love or we go the way of hate. That's it. And I'm just telling you that the way of love is way, way better. So as much as I, I possible, I try to grow in love every year. And you might say, well, Doc, how do you do that? Well, one of the ways is that I don't hold on to if somebody's upset with me. You know, I don't, I don't let that steal my joy or steal my love. So it means that if somebody's upset with me, obviously if I've done something, I try to apologize right away. And if, I, if, I if that's not possible, I just keep praying for them and praying for them and praying for them. And then you'll see that what happens to me is going to happen to you is that the, it just stops. You know, the bitterness just stops. Here, this probably is going to get cut off, but I'm going to tell you a story from a long time ago is that I saw one of my old clients who was in the elevator in Oak Park because uh, we were on the sixth floor. So I saw her and I'm like, geez, you, you know, Joanne, you look terrible. And then she explains to me, to make a long story short, she basically was a CIA agent and she explained to me that there was somebody on her team and she was a woman and at the time she said only 8% of the CIA agents in where she was were female and that there was this misogynist guy who was like merciless with her, merciless with her, okay, and it was really upsetting her. So when I got her back in the room, I just said, hey, you know, have you ever like taken the person out to lunch? And she said, you know, why would I do that? That guy, blah, blah, blah. I said, here, here's what we're going to do. Here's what I want you to do is you take him out to lunch. All you do is talk to him and then you hear him. And then if you find out he likes apple pie, then I need, I want you to bake an apple pie. And if it's still misery after that, I totally am going to pay for it. You know, I'll pay for the lunch, I'll pay for the apple pie, I'll pay for that. And then I treated her one time and the follow-up was their best buds, right? Because, you know, she found out the rest of the story. Of course, the rest of the story is he came from like an abusive family, blah, blah, blah. And he just needed somebody to go alongside of him that would love on him and care for him and listen to him. And that's mostly what most of us want. We just want somebody to listen to us and care for us. So I start this talk just by in medicine and in life, we're forgetting like the basic things of health. So the first basic thing of health is somebody needs to experience love and have love. So if right away somebody's sick and the first thing we do is give a medication and all this stuff and we're not looking at like so the various loves in somebody li somebody's life is going to be they love somebody loves god doesn't love god believes in god doesn't believe in god so i personally receive the love of god i think of myself as a beloved son of god that god loves me that i'm the object of god's affection and those of us who believe in god would say that God doesn't love any person more or less. He loves everybody the same, but he may not appreciate the things I do because if I do bad things toward his most beloved cre creatures, which are other human beings, if I mean to his most beloved uh, family, if you will, other human beings, of course, he's not going to like that. So, so love of God, then of course, love yourself. So love yourself. So Jesus taught, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love other people in the manner in which you love yourself. So loving myself means that I have the same opinion that God has of me. So if I'm beloved of God, I need to love myself. And it doesn't mean that I'm selfish. It just means that uh, God is happy with me. I don't have to do a bunch of stuff to a prove his love like he loves me. So I need to love myself and appreciate my uniqueness, my yellowness, if it were. Uh, and then I can't have my happiness be based on 
Izzy loves me, Nicole loves me, my patients love me, my wife loves me. Obviously, I hope Izzy loves me and Nicole loves me and my wife loves me, but there's gonna be times where my wife's upset with me or maybe I didn't get a patient better. You know, So I can't have my happiness or my self-identity be based on that. So, so love yourself, uh, love God, and you should you know, love your family. You should love your friends. You should love your work. You should love the things you do in your free time. Like there's all these things that you know you should love. So you should be surrounded by love. And then love by definition is supposed to be given out. It's supposed to be given up. So all of us obviously need to be helping other people. And the main thing we're supposed to do is help other people. Whether it's in medicine, whether it's calling an old friend, uh, whether it's uh, trying to use your gifts and talents that you individually have to teach the youngsters, right? The older people are supposed to teach the youngsters. So health starts with that. And then I'm gonna get into more and more about what's involved with health. But I just wanted to say that it definitely starts out with love. So natural medicine basically starts with the premise that the body has tremendous regenerative capacity. So we just got to get the body to have the maximum regenerative capacity, which may mean that there's lifestyle things that have to do. And dynamic structural medicine just means that God made the human body with a certain structure in mind that's ideal, which means in the neck that you have a lordotic curve and that the vertebrae are in alignment and the ligaments and muscles are strong to stabilize it. And once the neck becomes destabilized and the curve changes, then that's gonna change the fluid flow into and out of the brain, and it's gonna change the nerve impulse transmission to the brain and away from the brain. And you know, if you've seen other videos of mine, that's gonna affect the brain pressure, so the brain pressure goes up, it also might affect the vagus nerve, which is the main sensor of the body. So then the brain doesn't really know what's going on with the body accurately. So then the brain, which is the master computer, right, of the whole body, then the computer programming gets off and then the brain doesn't do ideally what's needed for the body. So then you get all kinds of illnesses. Now, in regard to long haul COVID, Basically, is there a structural cause for long haul COVID symptoms? Like in other words, could the actual symptoms of long haul COVID just be because there's a breakdown of the neck curve, which I term cervical destructure, which is affecting the vagus nerve and affecting the brain. And that's actually what's causing long haul COVID symptoms. Could post COVID-19 symptoms be coming from your neck? Can COVID-19 lead to tinnitus and all the myriad of symptoms that occur after a COVID infection? Can COVID-19 lead to internal vibrations or shivers? So meaning that uh, long haul COVID, uh, the, the syndrome, how do you end up getting tinnitus or how do you get dizziness or the other symptoms including uh, shivers or vibrations. So let's just first talk about uh, what happens with a viral infection. So uh, personally, I cared for s around 75 patients when there was COVID, so just know. I was at the bedside of sick COVID patients. Uh, I was in their houses, I, you know, I was in the apartments. I was, um, you know, I had friends from around the country that know that I, I'm, an, I'm an expert in natural medicine. So, uh, so I have personal experience seeing early COVID, then having uh, people that I loved, their oxygen go down, and then me as a physician trying to help them uh, regain their health. So of the 75 patients that I personally took care of, not in the office here, I mean just either via phone or I was actually at their houses, because, you know, Mary and I go to church, so we know church people, so they know I'm a physician. So uh, then um, of them, two of them did end up going into the hospital. They, everybody survived really good. I don't know of anybody who has long-haul COVID from those 75. 
the one got admitted, and then when, when she got admitted, it was the elderly person in a family. The other three recovered fine. By the time she got to the hospital, she was COVID negative, and she just had a secondary bacterial infection that needed like two days in the hospital, and she was fine. The other person was somebody who didn't contact me until they had the condition for like seven or eight days. So by the time I got involved with it, the disease process had progressed quite a bit. And then that person, so for about two or three days, we tried stuff uh, at home, but they eventually I sent them to the ER and then they were admitted. And they were admitted maybe about seven days. And I know long-term they're doing fine. So I've been in communication with them. Um, so during the whole COVID, you know, during the first bout of COVID, then the Delta variant and da da da, I would get communication from people that I knew that, for instance, they were really, really sick, and then all of a sudden, they're, they'd have unbelievable head pressure, or they'd have vibratory sense in their body, like almost like their body's vibrating. And we forget that when you're coughing all the time, like when you're coughing all the time, it's mini whiplashes, it's mini whiplashes. And then let's be honest, when you're in the bed, you know, when you're watching TV or you're just sick in bed, your head's all, your, your neck's all cockamamie. You know, you're, you're all flexed. That's not like a normal thing when you're upright. You know, I'm not walking around and I'm looking at the ground. So imagine for two days, your neck's all cockamamie. And believe it or not, there's so many of the symptoms that I completely got rid of when somebody was acutely ill with COVID. I would tell them, just lay on your stomach and, and put your hands, uh, like lay on your stomach, then elevate your neck, like extend your neck. Like I had one person who they were getting this horrible thoracic pain and then they were getting these vibratory scents. And I'll show you later on what causes that, but basically the posterior column of the spinal cord has too much pressure. So what they had to do was get, get this is basically the posture that you're in bed. So you have to do the opposite. You have to get extended, right? So I would have them do that and all, a lot of the head pressure, the... Um, the uh, vibratory sense, the pain in the lower part of the body, the body aches would go away because all of a sudden you're restoring the cervical curve. So viral infections or any kind of lot of coughing is going to give mini whiplashes. And then of course the position in bed has to be, has to not be flexed all the time. Now on many of these slides, I did put the reference. So just know anybody can check that is the information that Dr. Hauser is presenting here, is it correct? So this is from an article, COVID long haulers, long-term effects of COVID-19. And again, this is from John Hopkins Medical Center, one of the best medical centers in the country. The National Institutes of Health refer to long-term COVID-19 symptoms as PASC, which stands for post-acute sequelae of sars cov 2 more common terms are post-COVID syndrome, long COVID, or long-term COVID. People living with post-COVID syndrome are sometimes known as long haulers. So this whole video is about how to resolve this and to give you guys some other things to think about that it may be structural or it may just be you got to get back to the basics of health. And I gave you one tidbit is do you every day, every moment of every day have kindness, caring, security, love in your heart. Like is that the modus operandum that if I had a thought meter in your head and I got a readout, would the readout be peacefulness, calmness, joy, positivity? Or would the readout be is, you know, life's not fair to me, I anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, just mad, you know, just mad, angry, right? Um, there is no longer live COVID coronavirus running amok in the body. If tested, the person would test negative for the coronavirus, but they might be severely debilitated nonetheless. So again, this is John Hopkins just saying that 
you know, there has, there's something else beside just the COVID-19 virus uh, living in the person. So these are the common symptoms and we'll have other slides that say this, but so somebody at some point developed all these things and normally it occurs after they had active COVID. So, uh, but you know as well as I do, if anybody sees any of my videos and we talk about upper cervical instability, we talk about cervical destructure, you will know that this list is on there. This list, this exact list. So look at my videos on brain toilet obstruction, like when the internal jugular veins get obstructed here and your brain pressure goes up. Guess what the symptoms are? Cognitive decline, brain fog, headache, brain pressure. Then I did six hours of videos on the vagus nerve, like webinars on the vagus nerve. And then when the vagus nerve gets degenerated or injured or the impulses get blocked, you get what? Tachycardia, postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome. You get dizziness, you get anxiety, you know, you get where your stomach, you get this, these stomach issues or digestive issues and nobody can figure out why. So, the first thing, just know there isn't anything about this list that is any different than upper cervical instability or a, a breakdown of the cervical curve. So that's kind of my first point. Okay. And again, this is from the article, Post COVID-19 Syndrome, Long Haul Syndrome, Description of a Multidisciplinary Clinic at Mayo Clinic. So I'm starting this out by something from John Hopkins and something from the Mayo Clinic, right? Two of the stellar you know, medical centers in the United States. Mayo Clinic saying, well, they did a study, 100 patients, 68% women. Common presenting symptoms were fatigue, 80%, respiratory complaints, 59%, neurologic was 59%, followed by cognitive impairment, 45%, sleep, disturbance 30% and mental health symptoms 26%. One out of three difficulty with daily activities and one out of three difficulty returning. So my first point in this, and, it, and it'll be in other slides, isn't it interesting? There's twice as many females as males, right? Like, you know, there's twice as many females as males. So are we gonna say, did twice as many females get COVID than males? I don't think so. So what's the difference between males and females? The main difference is, and you've heard me say this a million times, females in general are much, much more loose jointed than males. They just are. We would agree they have different hormones and this and that, but structurally they have way looser joints than males, right? So that'll be another point that I'm gonna bring out. You know I've said this many times before, when a condition is much more common in females than males, it's probably either a joint problem, a joint instability problem, or it's a hormone problem, right? I'm not gonna say osteoporosis. I had a patient yesterday who had a compression fracture, osteoporosis. I'm not gonna say that's a joint instability thing. No, I have testosterone that builds bone, Women have one-tenth, one-fiftieth the dose of testosterone of a male, then their bones are going to be weaker. They don't have the, the bone-building hormone uh, testosterone, so they're going to be more prone to osteoporosis. Okay, post-COVID-19 syndrome is a multi-system disorder. And you know, oh, I touched it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I touched it. Now there's like, there's things here. I'm sorry. I, I already touched it. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mac. I should have used Mickey's finger. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, some of the studies show over 200 symptoms. The hypo So in other words, Mayo Clinic saying the hypotheses of what causes it includes low level persistent virus, though John Hopkins said, nope, there's no virus, dysregulated immune system, rogue antibodies, chronic inflammation, ah, vagus nerve dysfunction, right? It's not just Dr. Hauser saying 
vagus nerve dysfunction, this is Mayo Clinic, and others. Okay, so that's kind of a key point. So you'll see other articles, maybe it's the vagus nerve, maybe it's the vagus nerve. Okay, so, and again, these are all different articles. This is from Temple University. This is from the journal Neuroscience. Uh, this is from, you know, another journal. Yeah, so these are the references. So I just, and then this is a COVID-19 with the spike protein. So I wanted you guys to see that spike protein. So the spike protein, I kind of think of it like a drill. It helps the COVID-19 get into the cell. And, the, and basically it unlocks the cell and then COVID-19 got into the cell. Like, and then I want to bring up, and this is why this video might take so long, because I have to talk about how I was taught infection in medical school. And again, understanding the cure of disease, the cures of disease, and always know natural medicine providers, dynamic structural medicine providers are trying to cure disease. Now, I know I'm not supposed to use that term, but let's just say uh, if somebody had rheumatoid arthritis antibodies and I got them on a natural medicine program, vegetarian diet, don't do gluten, casein, uh, resolve all their stressors, and then they became rheumatoid factor negative, like they didn't produce antibodies anymore, I would just say they're in remission. So let's agree, let's just agree, the goal is to get these symptoms in remission, and hopefully then they, if somebody maintains their structural integrity, structural integrity of their neck, and then they, have a lifestyle that is just pro-health, there's a good chance that once their symptoms are resolved, they'll stay resolved, right? So, uh, so, we're, so we're talking about resolution. So uh, why antibiotics work so well, but antiviral medications don't work so well is in general, the bacteria are outside the cell. The bacteria are outside the cell, so they're in the plasma. So when you take an antibiotic, it permeates the plasma and it kills the bacterial infection. And let's agree, modern medicine with antibiotics with bacterial infection has been Herculean. Herculean, right? So I don't have a problem if I got a sore throat and it's all red back there and there's pus, I don't have a problem with me taking an antibiotic. I just don't. So it's not like I, I don't ever use medicines. Viral infections go inside the cell. So we do not still have good medications or diagnostics that can tell what's going on inside the cell. This is a major, major point of this video. So in other words, when you take an antiviral or you take herbal things to kill viruses. You just got to realize for the most part, it stays outside the cell because to get inside the cell, you got to have something that's going to get it inside the cell. Now there's things like exosomes and different things. Even some of the vaccines, they encapsulate them in different things because it's very difficult to get stuff inside the cell. And always know when you get lab tests, this is really interesting what I'm going to say because most people don't know this is, when you take a thyroid test, they're not testing the thyroid that's actually inside the cell. They're just testing the thyroid amount outside the cell. But what the only thing that, prim the primary thing that matters is how much thyroid gets inside the cell and speeds up your metabolism. So there's doctors who do natural medicine and I did this for many years. You know, now you guys know I, emphasize the structure versus the, the chemicals or the hormones, even though I still prescribe hormones for some of my patients. But imagine somebody who their thyroid tests are within the normal range, okay? But they have all the symptoms of hypothyroid. They, they're, they're overweight. They can't lose weight. They're cold all their time. Their hair might be falling out their reflexes are slow. Like they have all the symptoms of thyroid, but they go to the endocrinologist and it's all fine. So a natural medicine doctor might say, well, you have subclinical hypothyroid. 
meaning you don't have enough thyroid to get inside the cell or there's some reason the thyroid's not getting inside the cell. So then doctors like myself might try some low dose thyroid because maybe they just have to have an increased dose in the plasma to get inside the cell. And it's unbelievable. Sometimes you just give a little bit of thyroid and the person's like, oh my gosh, my body temperature's going up, my hair stops falling out, I'm not constipated anymore. So that's like sometimes the traditional doctor is doing what they've been taught and I'm just saying that it may be it's correct, your lab tests show that the do the, in the plasma is the normal dose, but it might be the problem is it's not getting inside the cell and we don't have a, a test to say how, what's going inside the cell. So viruses and organisms like Lyme disease they, they can get inside the cell, and when it gets inside the cell, it's much harder to get rid of, but we don't even have good tests to show that it's inside the cell. So that's like, that's where, you know, so somebody might be, let's just say for Lyme's disease, they have all that myriad of symptoms that long haul COVID has, right? Because if you looked at chronic Lyme, it's the same myriad of symptoms, cognitive decline, joint aching, memory issues, uh, neck pain, dizziness is the same thing. So then they do tests that are what? It's in the plasma. They're doing like plasma tests. You know, so then people might get on long-term antibiotics and long-term this and long-term that, but there's no definitive way to say that it's inside the cell. So you're surmising it is where I would say a much easier approach is maybe it's, there's a structural cause of the, of the person's symptoms. And I've said this in other videos that even Lyme's disease, right? I was one of the doctors that treated Lyme, long-term long Lyme's disease with all kinds of things, high dose vitamin C, antibiotics, all kinds of things. And I just don't do it anymore because we correct the neck structure and the symptoms go away. So I can say they had, this person had long-term Lyme and we just got their vagus nerve functioning good and their immune system good and then they got rid of it or all the symptoms were just from vagus nerve dysfunction and or intracranial hypertension from the jugular vein being compressed. So that's like a key point. So, so in other words, even with long haul COVID, like let's just say somebody has long haul COVID and the the blood test shows systemic inflammation right high sensitivity c-reactive protein the person got and the numbers were up and then we correct the neck structure stabilize their neck with prolotherapy do curve correction and then the c-reactive protein goes down and their symptoms go down i don't know the exact mechanism exactly why all their symptoms go down it could be that they had systemic inflammation, that's why they were all achy all over. It could be that they had microclots, because we'll talk about that, in their capillaries, and that resolved. All I know is when we get their structure good, because we're, we're trying to get the body the way God had originally made it, stable, good neck structure, receiving love, giving love, eating healthy, taking good vitamins, and then health restored. Okay, so the COVID research, this is just some basic things. SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins disrupt the blood-brain barrier. So in other words, you know, there's data that when you have COVID infection that it disrupts the blood-brain barrier and the spike proteins disrupt the blood-brain barrier. So um, am I saying that's what's causing it? I'm just saying that they found this. So apparently, and again, I'm not an expert on the COVID vaccine, so I'm not gonna comment too much on it, just that the, the COVID vaccines in part work by making spike proteins. So we just know that the spike proteins can disrupt the blood-brain barrier. The S1 protein of SARS-CoV-2 crosses the blood-brain barrier in mice. So, uh, so the point is, does that happen in humans? Probably, but, it, you know, so it, so in other words, like 
there's, when people die of COVID, there has been researchers that then, then examine the brains of the people that died, right? So that's kind of important. Does that correlate then with long haul COVID? I don't know. All we know is that when they do autopsies on people that have died from COVID, these are some things they find. Like in other words, they'll find that when they test the tissue, that the spike protein can disrupt the blood brain barrier. And then you'll see other things. It says SARS CoV 2 may infect both peripheral cells capable of crossing the blood brain barrier and brain endothelial cells to traverse the blood brain barrier and spread into the brain. So the point is, there's lots of different ways that, the, the, that COVID can get into the brain. It can infect the cell, the cell goes into the brain, then, or the spike protein, say from the vaccine, then can get into the brain. Research strongly suggests COVID-19 virus enters the brain. I mean, that's the whole point. So does that then long-term cause problems with brain function? That's still to be determined, but these are just facts that we know that, uh, that the COVID can enter the brain. So this just kind of shows that there's a blood-brain barrier. See, there's a blood-brain barrier. So in other words, you eat a salami sandwich that has a preservative in it, right? So it may be that your blood-brain barrier is going to protect the brain from that preservative, like if the preservative was dangerous for the brain. However, if something disrupts the blood-brain barrier, that's not good because then it means that the very barrier that God made to protect the brain isn't there anymore. I just want to explain how the brain pressure goes up and because of high brain pressure, it breaks down the blood-brain barrier. So if you go on Google and you just typed in idiopathic, meaning we don't know the cause, intracranial hypertension and blood-brain barrier, you'll see that high brain pressure can absolutely disrupt the blood-brain barrier. And the, the BBB, that's what keeps bad things out of the brain. It can keep organisms out of the brain. It can keep um, substances out of the brain. But the most common cause that I think of something that disrupts the blood-brain barrier is increased brain pressure from obstruction of the jugular vein. So if we just say this is the jugular veins, right? And then if the atlas, which is, if the atlas, which is C1, you could see that as the atlas goes forward, there's tension on the jugular vein here. And the jugular vein, it goes into the, the hole called the jugular foramen. So the jugular foramen is the hole that the vagus nerve and the jugular vein goes into to enter the brain. So the jugular vein and the vagus nerve, they run right together. So whatever is going on in the jugular vein is going to go on in the vagus nerve. So if the jugular vein is getting compressed, then likely the vagus nerve is getting stretch and compression also. So while the brain pressure is going up with jugular vein compression, because the cervical curve is screwed up and there's tension on the jugular vein, you might say, well, how's the cervical curve getting screwed up? The normal cervical curve is lordosis. So in other words, it's like this. But you and I, let's be honest, we, we're addicted to our cell phones, so we're like this all day. So because we're like this all day, the curve can go like this to like that. And you could be walking around right now and your curve's like this. So in other words, the atlas, which is the first cervical vertebrae, instead of being here, in 3D space, it's one and a half inches too far forward. So the one and a half inches too far forward does what? It's gonna compress the jugular vein. And some people have an elongated styloid. So it's, so it's a bone that can elongate because of we're in this position and the styloid connects the stylomandibular ligament and the stylohyoid ligament. So when you go like this, that ligament pull, those ligaments pull on this bone and over time, the ligament can get calcified, which we call an elongated styloid. So in other words, the jugular vein can also be compressed in the front 
by an elongated styloid and in the back from the atlas. So the combination of it does what? Injures the vagus nerve, injures the brain by increasing the brain pressure because the main conduit of fluid out of the brain is the jugular vein, especially when you're laying down. 70% of the fluid in the brain is in the venous system. So imagine if you're laying down at night and instead of the brain getting restored, being able to remove toxins that are in it, including spike protein or COVID, and it can't, all that can accumulate is more toxicity, more, more things that are damaging to the brain. So then the brain is getting assaulted because of high brain pressure that's not getting resolved because the person doesn't know they have a structural neck problem. And then chemically, by neuroinflammation or some other mechanisms inside the brain, that substances that damage normal nerve cells are then accumulating, you could see where the brain cells can start dying. So we call, when brain cells die, start dying, we call that neurodegeneration. And when enough neurodegeneration occurs, you get what? Dementia, right? You get Alzheimer's, you get, you know, the, the thing that we all fret might happen to us. Um, so here, I'm gonna give these back and then we're gonna try to do the rest of this uh, where uh, you know, there's not, we just let the thing of, we don't stop the taping. So the blood brain barrier, that basically is the, oh, I touched the thing again. Jeez, I screwed up again. Okay, so the blood brain barrier, that basically is the tight junctions that keep stuff from the blood. <clears throat> so blood enters the brain by the carotid artery and the vertebral arteries. Then the blood gets filtered, if you will from the blood-brain barrier, so the fluid inside the brain is typically clear. You know, and then we call that cerebral spinal fluid, and that's what nourishes the brain. But if the blood-brain barrier is disrupted, then substances get into the brain that shouldn't. And basically, oh, this is a cartoon illustrating the brain interstitial system, the ISS between the neural cells comprising the ISF and the extracellular matrix. So basically the cerebral spinal fluid is the clear fluid that nourishes the cells. Then in our office, we can see extra cerebral spinal fluid around the eye nerve. That's why we do uh, orbital or eye ultrasound. And basically what we're doing is we're measuring the optic nerve sheath diameter and when there's a blockage of drainage of the brain through the internal jugular vein, a process called CSF stasis, like there's not the normal flow of cerebral spinal fluid, and then it can accumulate in different places. When this cerebral spinal fluid accumulates like in the frontal lobe, you're gonna get frontal lobe damage. When it accumulates in the brain stem, you get flattening of the pons, and that can cause brain stem problems, brain stem damage. And when it accumulates around the eye nerve, you can get decreased transmission of images from your eye to the back of the brain. And that's where you get blurriness of vision, double vision, problems focusing, which we see in a lot of people who've been diagnosed with post-COVID uh, infection or long-haul COVID. So leading neurologic manifestations in COVID-19 symptoms are classified miscellaneous. So you can see that miscellaneous headache, encephalopathy, uh, you can get strokes, you can get ataxia, which is where you get balance problems, and all kinds of sensory symptoms. So with long haul COVID, you can get parosmia, uh, where you have changes in your sense of smell, like you can smell things that aren't even there, you can get where you can't smell, you can get hypersensitivity to smell. Then, so with upper cervical instability or changes in the cervical curve or long haul COVID, you can get hypersensitivity sensory syndrome. So I wanna explain that. It's very common to get 
hypersensitivity to sound, hypersensitivity to sight, you can get hypersensitivity to smells. These are all issues with the cranial nerves. So the question is, you know, what could cause all these hypersensitivity syndromes? Well, I just said to you that when you get CSF stasis, the cerebral spinal fluid can go around any of the cranial nerves. So cranial nerves are surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid. The cervical nerve roots, the spinal cord, the brain is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid. So if the cerebral spinal fluid gets, um, the fluid flow gets stopped or inhibited, then that can put pressure on any uh, cranial nerve. So that's where, again, you could get trigeminal neuralgia, which is cranial nerve five. You can get uh, sound sensitivity because the cerebral spinal fluid irritates cranial nerve seven or the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. If the cerebral spinal fluid irritates cranial nerve nine, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve, that's where you get swallowing problems. And the glossopharyngeal nerve is the main sensor for blood pressure. So if you notice with long haul COVID, like you're dizzy and they tell you you have POTS and your blood pressure readings are all off. I've even seen people where they have high blood pressure for no reason. They're thin, they eat organic, and it's because their glossopharyngeal nerve isn't working right. If you wanna do a simple test at home, I, in the office, I take a tongue blade and I just, you know, irritate the back of the throat or your palate. You could do the same thing with your palate and you should get a really massive gag reflex. So if you, even with your toothbrush, you irritate your palate or you irritate the back of your throat and you're like, geez, like I'm not gagging of that. You probably have a glossopharyngeal problem. And again, you might say, well, how does that, occur with what you're saying, doctor, that my neck curve's all cockamamie. And that, I think that's an English word, cockamamie. Just a great word. But in the carotid sheath, where the jugular vein is located and the vagus nerve is located, so is the glossopharyngeal nerve. So it's the same process by stretch compression because all of a sudden now the uh, structures in there are stretched because the shortest distance from here to the brain is going to be when there's a lordotic curve. So I think that's an important point too. Just think about when you have a change in your, uh, your cervical curve, basically everything has to travel an increased distance. And all it takes is a 5 to 6% stretch of a nerve and impulses get blocked. So what's going to happen if impulses are blocked? of the vagus nerve to your stomach, the stomach doesn't work. Food just sits there. You get bloating, constipation, you feel nauseous. If the nerve impulses get blocked to the heart from the vagus nerve, the left vagus nerve, you get tachycardia because the vagus nerve is what decreases the heart rate. So this is a great article I recommend you guys look at. It's called The Pathological Sequelae of Long Haul COVID. And that's in, uh, a natural immune, immunology journal, and it's 2022 at State of the Art. It explains acute COVID symptoms and post-COVID. So you're gonna see there's all kinds of things that have been talked about or seen in long haul COVID. Skin rashes, Graves disease, Hashimoto's, glucose issues, hearing loss, tinnitus, red eyes, sore throat. Vasovagal, there you go again, orthostatic hypotension, vagus nerve. That can be a vagus nerve symptom. That can be a vagus nerve symptom. Nausea, weight loss, altered bowel, bowel motility. Well, what's the nerve supply to the bowels? That's the vagus nerve. It, when the vagus nerve innervates the bowels, like you stimulate the vagus nerve, what happens? You get contractility. So if you've noticed, and somebody's diagnosed you with long haul COVID, and you have decreased motility of the esophagus, gastroparesis, or they said that you have irritable bowel syndrome. It absolutely could be that you have vagus nerve degeneration. So then you'd say, well, how do you di diagnose vagus nerve degeneration? In our office, we measure the vagus nerve. We measure the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve's uh, diameter should be 
Normal is about 1.8 millimeters. Do you know yesterday I saw a patient that the uh, vagus nerve on one side was 0.5 and then the history of the patient was about two years before, so two years before she saw me, she had a very severe atrial fibrillation. Now I can't prove definitively that her left vagus nerve degeneration caused the atrial fibrillation, but think about it. If the left vagus nerve innervates the AV node and that's what slows or inhibits bad focuses of nerve activity in the heart. So in other words, that's kind of the blockade, just like the blood-brain barrier. The AV node in the heart, that's the blockade of any of too high of heartbeats or heartbeats that are occurring in other places than the pacemaker of the heart. The AV node is like the guard. And what keeps the guard strong is the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve innervates the AV node so the heart rate doesn't go crazily high and you don't get an arrhythmia. So imagine if you have degeneration of the left vagus nerve, now that that gatekeeper can't be there, then all kinds of abnormal beats get through and then of course you could get an arrhythmia. Okay, and again, lab abnormalities. So in patients that we've seen, so patients that I've seen that have long haul COVID, this is what I've seen, and it's not like 8,000 patients. I'm just saying, I'm just an average doctor trying to take care of people who said they either had a vaccine shot and they haven't felt good since then, or they've uh, had COVID infection, they haven't felt good since then. When I test them, most of them have uh, elevated high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is uh, where they have high uh, inflammation in their blood, and a good portion of them have autoantibodies. Now, I can't prove 100% that all that stuff's from a COVID vaccine shot or the COVID infection they had. I'm just saying what I see in the office. So, so there definitely are doctors who've seen different kind of things elevated in post-COVID syndrome. They've seen elevated neutrophils, which seem to indicate that there's still some kind of infection going on. Elevated D-dimer, that's because there's some kind of clotting going on, some kind of clotting, abnormal clotting. And then the rest of these just show that there's something going on in some people with clotting, with inflammatory markers. And again, uh, just so many different symptoms. Look at that, all kinds of respiratory symptoms that occur uh, with post-COVID syndrome. Fatigue is obviously a big one. Uh, small joint arthritis, uh, myalgias, just achiness all over. But again, these are common symptoms that we see with upper cervical instability and cervical destructure when the neck curve uh, gets reversed. Vertigo, right? You've heard me talk a lot about vertigo. Vertigo, vertigo in our experience is that a person has upper cervical instability. Here, I'm gonna take this one. I'll be careful here. So see how in the, in the vertebrae here is the vertebral artery. So the vertebral artery goes in a hole throughout the uh, cervical vertebrae and then it wraps around C1, it wraps around C1. So if you have instability of C1, the artery gets kinked and that kinking of the artery, the vertebral artery can absolutely cause you to have vertigo. So if you turn your head and you've noticed that that's when you get the vertigo, I'm just telling you, you got some kind of probably upper cervical instability and you probably have what I, what I described previously is that your atlas is way, way too far forward. And let's be honest, if the brain pressure is really high, you can get anything and probably you're gonna get kind of a malaise feeling because your brain pressure is so high, your brain's not functioning right. You're probably gonna have trouble at work because you can't think as clearly. You're gonna feel kind of depressed. So that's why I think brain fog and all those manifestations probably are that the brain pressure is too high. And you might say, well, doc, how do you document that the brain pressure is too high? 
Now the gold standard is you stick a needle into the spinal fluid and you measure the pressure, right? I don't want to be doing that on patients. I'd rather find non-invasive ways. So the two main non-invasive ways, you might even say three ways that we do it. One is we look at optic nerve sheath diameter. So about 95% of people with high brain pressure have elevation of the optic nerve sheath diameter. Then the second way is when the brain pressure goes up, the brain sometimes gets so nervous that it dilates the arteries. So we see in the middle cerebral arteries, we see just high velocities. The velocity should be 65 centimeters per second. We're seeing like 100, 110, 120. So that's a second way that we're seeing the manifestations of of high brain pressure. And of course, if we have a person and they're upright and we do an ultrasound at C1 and their jugular vein is completely closed, you know, and then we have them lay down and it's not even that open when they're laying down, you know, like, you know, everything's adding up that this is closed off, their optic nerve sheath diameter is high, their brain velocities are high, they have brain fog, depression, they can't work so much because their brain function is low. It all adds up to intracranial hypertension. Um, th I made this one you know, with my media team. I researched all these articles. So you see it's very, very re well referenced. So the scientific explanation or theories on the cause of long haul symptoms. So this is an important slide. You'll see that I put on it why are females two times more likely to suffer from long haul COVID-19 syndrome? So you see that, you'll see that there's several good, with a lot of patients, why is it two times more likely in females? So you heard me say, I'm just telling you females are more loosey-goosey in their joints than males. We all know it, they have much more flexibility. The hormone estrogen that inhibits fibroblastic proliferation where testosterone stimulates it. The fibroblasts are what repair the ligaments. They're the cells that grow the ligaments. So if females have many, many, many times more estrogen than a male. And that would be, so their repairability of ligaments is less. And then we have a hormone as a male that stimulates the cells that make ligaments, that's another mechanism by which we have an advantage. So most chronic pain clinics have twice as many or three times as many female patients as males. So that would mean then that if it is a ligamentous problem, if long haul COVID is a ligamentous problem structurally, it means that you have to treat it structurally. So the way you treat it structurally is Make sure the person's computer screen is high, right? Because you wanna induce the lordotic curve. Then people have to stop looking at their cell phones. If you're gonna do the cell phone, my friends, uh, Yana and Leonid in Boston, thank you for the tripod. They sent me a tripod because how they do their cell phone is they don't look down. They have the tripod up. No, so it's a very, very good, idea and even the TV I'd recommend have your TV up because if all you do is look down you're gonna you're breaking down your cervical curve breaking down your cervical curve you're increasing your brain pressure you're damaging your vagus nerve among other nerves so again it's interesting many researchers saw, see that it's more likely in females so the main mechanism by which the various theories scientific researchers have said that somebody gets long haul COVID is vagus nerve injury, autonomic nervous system dysfunction. But again, that can be the vagus nerve. So there's the autonomic nervous system is supposed to be balanced, meaning that normally when you're peaceful, you're loving, you're caring, and you're in a non-stressful environment, your vagal tone, if you will, should be higher than your sympathetic tone. So in other words, the vagus nerve is part of the rest and relax nervous part, part of the nervous system, which is called the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic system or adrenaline, that's for stress. So imagine if a person 
has autonomic nervous system dysfunction, meaning they have vagus nerve degeneration. The vagus nerves are smaller, meaning that the nerve cells of the vagus nerve have actually died. And they constantly live in a state of stress because their vagus nerves are so weak. Do you think it's, they're going to get symptoms if you live in a constant state of stress? So the way you tell whether you live in a constant state of stress is you got to get a heart rate variability monitor. So the one that I use personally is from Elite HRV. I don't have any, I don't get royalties or that's just the one that I use. So I would recommend everybody monitor their heart rate variability, especially if you have long haul COVID. And then with Elite HRV, I try to get it greater than 70. So if it's less than 70, it just means that I'm not optimal as far as my vagal tone, like some of the vagus nerve impulses are getting blocked or uh, my vagus nerve isn't healthy. And the way that I help my vagal tone is I don't perseverate on negative things. I, I like a lot of alone time, so I, I, I have a lot of alone time. I listen to music that raises my HRV. So for me, it's like Paca Bell, it's uh, Andrea Bocelli. Believe it or not, it's not the music that I normally would listen to, which is like Motown and uh, uh, you know Journey and the kind of the music I grew up with. I'm not saying I never listen to that music, but that's not, that music lowers my HRV. And you're gonna see that any jazzy rock and roll music, it lowers your, your HRV because it, it actually induces the adrenaline system, which gives you an immediate high, but that's not good if you have long haul COVID. Like people with long haul COVID might say, I'm just telling you, if I take amphetamines or I drink a lot of coffee, I feel better. Yeah, you. it's just like listening to rock and roll. Yeah, you immediately feel better, but long term it's not good because you're better off moment to moment, day by day, feeling relaxation and calmness and rest. And then you shouldn't have 800 million thoughts going through your mind. So if you're somebody who you can't turn your mind off, you've got to work on it. So I'm going to tell you how I did it because I'm an artist and I have to come up with all these slides. So trust me, I, got, I have a lot of things I got to do. So I got to have a lot of things to be worried about. Uh, so many years ago, um, I came across the research of Dr. Jacobson, who wrote the book, You Must Relax, and he was the grandfather of biofeedback. So two of his discoveries were that a person fell asleep the moment their muscles of their face relaxed, and the second discovery was every time you have a thought, you contract the muscles of your face. And I was having a lot of insomnia at that time and I just was having racing thoughts and ADD and all this stuff. And I noticed, like I'll just tell you what happened last night. So go in the bed, I had, hadn't seen Marion all day, hold her hand, talking to her. Then in the middle of her actually talking, she falls asleep. Now it couldn't it be because my conversation is so boring because you guys know you listen to me. Like, man, that guy's interesting. But no, but she could tell me something. She literally could tell me something that's awful about something that happened. Then she, the next minute she can fall asleep. So once I learned the Dr. Jacobson thing, Marion's a doer. I'm, I, was, I was a thinker. I'm becoming a doer. So in other words, all my patients who were doers, they just didn't have any insomnia. They didn't even have a lot of anxiety. And then once... I started treating COVID patients. It was unbelievable in the families, and this is something, again, why people have to watch this whole video. So in the families, like say there was two kids, two adults, maybe a grandma and a grandpa. The more left brain somebody was, the milder the symptoms of COVID when, they get, when the COVID ravaged the family. And say they had a kid who was, uh, like a teenager who was anxious or one of the spouses who just had an anxious personality. It was normally the artists. It was normally the thinkers. Yeah, they would get COVID the worst. 
So think about what I just said. And you might, guys might think of your own family or other family members. When they got COVID, in my experience, in almost every family, the more left brain, the more analytical, the more somebody was a doer versus a thinker, they had the mildest symptoms, they didn't get long haul COVID, then the people who were the artists, the Ross Housers, the thinkers, uh, the worriers, if you will, they had the worst COVID and then those were the people that ended up getting long haul COVID. So, in, and, and also you might even say they were the melancholies and they were the more Debbie Downers, they were the more people who kind of looked at things of everything that could go wrong versus everything that could go right. So that would mean to me as a doctor that the real issue relates to the thinking, the worrying, and if there is a structural component to it, that's the real issue, not the circumstances, right? Not the circumstances. We're looking at the circumstances, like somebody got COVID, then it's the circumstance that's causing all the problems. No, the circumstance was just the straw that broke the camel's back. So that's kind of an, another interesting point. So, because um, I'll give you an example. Somebody will say to me, well, I got mold toxicity. Like that's what I got, mold toxicity. Then I'm like, how many members are in your family? So say there's three kids, a father and a mother, right? And then they're saying, I'm under this whole complicated thing for mold toxicity, da, da, da. And I'm like, how many people were living in that house? They'd say five. How's everybody else doing? Fine. And you're real sick. You see the difference? I'm not saying that for that person, mold toxicity doesn't exist. I'm not saying that the person didn't have COVID and they got really, really sick. What I'm saying is we're missing the big picture, which is why is this particular person, the mold's affecting them and it's not affecting anybody else. Every place in Florida, there's mold, right? You go to the Hauser's house, I guarantee you two or three times a year, we have to have the whole house, the whole outside of the house power wash because there's just mold everywhere. So there's mold everywhere in the air. It's a high humidity thing. So why is it that this particular person is so sick and we're addressing primarily the mold, right? You got to get rid of all your, you got to get rid of all your furniture. You got to get rid of all your clothes. You got to move into a new house. You have to be on this complicated mold thing. And I'm not saying that mold toxicity doesn't exist, nor am I saying that a person shouldn't see a mold doctor, but I'm just saying that you should first look at why it's affecting you versus somebody else and why it's affecting you. I'm just saying a lot of it's gonna be, it's the vagus nerve. You're, you have vagus nerve degeneration, you have autonomic nervous system dysfunction, and that is probably Nowadays, I'm not saying 50 years ago, nowadays we have cell phones and you're on your cell phone, the average American's on their cell phone six hours a day, plus they're hunched over a computer, right? I said, let's get our computers way, way up. So, and I'm, and I'm also saying that when we help the neck structure and the vagus nerves get bigger and the HRV goes up, guess what? And the jugular veins become open doctor, my brain fog's going away. My tinnitus is going away. My, I had a patient the other day, I kid you not, I saw them one visit. They had 30 attacks of trigeminal neuralgia a day. The history that I got when I walked in on the second visit, I saw them one visit. And Dr. Hutchinson saw them one visit. Doctor, I'm 98% better. Why? Because we very quickly get your thing up. We put some weights on them, do that. I did one brolotherapy and then we're down to like a couple little attacks a day. And that's like somebody who's already seen 25 doctors. And I'm not saying that every trigeminal neuralgia case is like that, but I'm just saying that it's, you could easily say trigeminal neuralgia, it's a virus, it's this, it's that. I'm just saying, correct your neck structure 
because that's something easily you guys can do at home. You can monitor your own vagus nerve function. You can get very inexpensively a lateral C-spine x-ray to see that your neck curve isn't good. And then, uh, you know, you guys can correct that. And if it doesn't, if symptoms don't correct, then yeah, you might see a place like us. But to just like say just address, see where this also says microclots, right? So they found that there is a clotting thing in some people with long haul COVID. So you would say, well, how do you address that? Well, how I address it is, is proper diet, right? Because if you're on the right diet for your diet type, and I'd recommend you guys go to hauserdiet.com. Maybe you can still get the Hauser Diet book used, you know, at various places you can get it used. It's not in print anymore. Recommend you try to be on the right diet. So I'll just refer you to that as far as diet. I personally take fish oil capsules. Um, I take enzymes. Uh, obviously, Marion cooks with a lot of garlic. I take magnesium, all these things thin the blood. I do take aspirin, so I've been a big proponent of aspirin. And the reason is always know acetylsalicylic acid is from willow bark. So I look at aspirin as a natural substance that's in willow bark. That's what I do. Uh, for years, I took one baby aspirin a day. Now I take one regular aspirin a week. So I take one regular aspirin a week. So I think the data on aspirin is very good that it helps the, keep the blood thin. When I do prolotherapy, I can tell just when I do prolotherapy whose blood's thin, whose blood's healthy and whose blood's not. He might say, well, how do you do that? I'm just telling you, anybody who's observed prolotherapy when I do the injections and they're bleeding, some people's blood, I'm just telling you, it's red, the most beautiful red unbelievably red it's oxygenated well and other people's blood it looks black i kid you not you could poke yourself it doesn't look really really red like it's well oxygenated or it looks black and there's not very much oxygen and anyone who's taking care of cancer patients their blood is black so i can tell that the other thing i can tell is you should bleed a lot with prolotherapy you should, like boom, hole, boom, hole, boom, hole, boom, hole. And I'm just telling you, some of the patients, it's like there's no bleeding. You know, so that's not good. I could, so in other words, I know they have coagulopathy. They have thick blood. So when you have thick blood, is it easier for the heart if the blood's like molasses or is it easier for the heart if the blood's like water? Think about the pressure. When the blood's like molasses and the heart and all the pressure on the heart and the number one killer of human beings in Western culture, it's not COVID or anything like that. It's not even close. It's what? Heart disease. And then the second big killer is cancer. In both of those, you'll see that the pathophysiology, a lot of is clots. It's clots, it's clots. So please do something that's thinning the blood. Then, okay, so I'm gonna tell you <laughs> a study from the 1950s. I used to, I don't have a slide with this, but basically all they did was check bleeding time with people who were going to donate blood. And they put them in like five categories. So the category was persons calm as can be, okay? They draw, they do a bleeding time, which was they, they, they prick your skin, then they had paper. How long did it take the paper not to have a blood drip on it? So people who were, extremely calm when they walked in to draw the blood, it was eight to nine minutes. So really thin blood. Then they had mild, moderate, severe anxiety, like to draw the blood. Then, then so it was like seven to eight minutes and the second group was like five to six minutes and the really anxious people, they would clot in like one minute. So imagine if you are in a state of chronic anxiety, chronic fear, you spent, you spend your time watching the news every day and all the fearful stuff that's going on in the world. And then you go to sleep. So your last thought before you go to sleep, where you're supposed to get restorative street sleep for your brain, for your body, like your body has to heal everything that happened in the day. And the last thing that you saw before you went to bed was, you know, there's a war here. 
the politician did this, somebody's murdered. Like, is that really something that's going to help you in your health like that you should be doing? So those of us who are in natural health believe like an hour before bed or a half an hour before bed, you've got to get into that really peaceful, joyful, calm state, whatever you need to do for that, you know, whatever you need to do for that. So, uh, so just think about that. And I just told you that if you don't and you have that anxiety or whatever, basically in your free time, you're doing something that's damaging your health. Is that really what all of us should be doing is doing stuff in our free time to damage your health? I don't think it's a good idea. So the other mechanisms of long haul COVID symptoms are direct CNS invasion through broken blood brain barrier, the trigeminal nerve, olfactory nerves, or the vagus nerves in the lungs. So meaning that the vagus nerve is a two way traffic thing. So the vagus nerve takes signals from your body, even in your state of stress, it takes, it goes to the brain, then it, then it also goes out to slow the heart rate and to do all the great actions that it does to give the body health. Well, basically then if COVID or spike protein or something gets into the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve can take it into the brain. The, 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 the olfactory nerve, which is in the nose, it can take it into the brain and the trigeminal nerve can also take things right into the brain. So overactive immune system, we talked about systemic inflammation and autoimmunity is just that whenever you have an infection, the body's going to make some antibodies toward the infection. So the antibodies attach to the organism, like let's just say streptococcus, then basically then your immune system recognizes the antibody. So wherever it sees an antibody, it's going to grab it and then the lymph system is going to destroy it basically. So what happens is that uh, if things get into the body or the brain, like let's just say, uh, and again, I just used an example of a preservative, let's just say a preservative gets somewhere where it shouldn't, the body technically can make antibodies against the preservative because the preservative is not supposed to be there. So the immune system recognizes, no, when something's new to the body, like coronavirus that it's never seen before, the body's assuming that it's bad for the body. So then the body's likely gonna make antibodies against it. So that's another reason why it's so dangerous to have a breakdown in the blood brain barrier or to have a breakdown in the gut barrier. So increased brain pressure causes the breakdown probably in the blood brain barrier. What causes a breakdown in the gut barrier is going to be vagus nerve degeneration. So in animals, when you damage the vagus nerve, what happens is you have increased permeability in the gut and that increased permeability makes somebody prone to making autoantibodies against itself because again, it means that in the digestive tract and 90, 80 to 90% of your immune system is in your digestive tract. So think of it this way, think of it this way. Where should your immune system defenses be? It should be right around all your orifices. Like what's gonna harm the human body? It's gonna be something you breathe probably because that enters the body or something you eat. So a lot of the immune system defenses are what? In the lungs and then they're gonna be in the digestive tract. So in the digestive tract, it's called gut associated lymphoid tissue. And then, so if the intestinal barrier gets broken because of vagus nerve degeneration. Substances get exposed to the gut associated lymphoid tissue that it shouldn't. So then the, it starts shooting antibodies and sometimes it makes antibodies that go against your own cells. So that would be like rheumatoid factor. It would be like smooth muscle antibody or anti-nuclear antibody ANA, which we see in diseases like lupus. So this just explains how COVID or various infections can basically enter the brain. So that's basically what this illustration is. 
then again, remember I said, if you have vagus nerve degeneration, you can have increased inflammation during COVID, which would give you acute, more severe acute COVID. It can give you systemic inflammation. The blood brain barrier can break down. You can make antibodies, clots, elevated brain pressure, dysautonomia. And then what actually is causing the vagus nerve degeneration? I'm just saying it's probably cervical destruction and ligamentous cervical instability. But let me just say that in general, the three main causes in human beings of what damages the vagus nerve is something the person sees as very, very stressful. For instance, if somebody was in a really bad marriage for a long period of time, that could cause vagus nerve degeneration just because they've been under so much stress. If somebody had a child who was on drugs and they were very, very worried, obviously right now as Danielle and Tom are in the ICU every day, every day, you got to realize as healthy as they are, you know, basically their vagus nerves are in incredible, incredible assault. This, you guys will find this interesting. So I was, the day before, last Saturday I was with Tom, I was giving him laughter therapy. So I said, you know, so we had a liquid lunch and you guys know what that is, liquid lunch. So we were, I got him laughing, da da da. And I said, hey, you know, in the womb, the baby has a cervical curve. So I said, I feel like, are they making sure that the babies, the, their newborn infants, their premature infants, are they doing anything with the cervical cord? And I said, doc, man, they're on it and on it. In other words, the very positioning that they do in the neonatal intensive care unit is to make sure that those babies have a cervical curve. And I'm like, man, they're doing a lot of stuff right. If only humans, like you guys, me, like we can't be every day where you're like this with a computer and think like nothing's gonna happen to your brain, it's crazy. Like we should have the new ergonomics is where you're like this, like you're like this. So in the office, when somebody comes in and we've done a digital motion x-ray to see what happens to their cervical curve when they look up, I'll just say, hey, Margaret, uh, you know, look up where the top of the cabinet is and I'll have them hold it for like a minute. And I'm like, you know, you good? And they're like, doc, I feel, it feels fine. And I've even had people say, oh my gosh, I actually feel better. Like in other words, they can almost feel like their brain's draining. I'm like, do that as much as you can. You know, do it as much as you can. So, uh, so that would be one of my edicts for you guys. Just do that. There's very, so in other words, the three main things that, damage the vagus nerve. One is if the blood sugars are too high. So I'm going to do some stuff on blood sugars in future videos. Like you don't realize when your glycosylated hemoglobin is over six, it's as if, I, I don't know exactly the number, but it's something like all day long in a 24 hour period, it's like your blood sugar is 123 or something. If your glycosylate hemoglobin is over six and the doctor says that's fine, are you crazy? Like that you're getting low level sugar toxicity every moment of every day and basically that damages nerves. And one of the nerves that it damages is the vagus nerve. So if you looked up my chart and you'll see that almost every time when Dr. Hauser checked this glycosylate hemoglobin, 5.2, 5.2, 5.2. Not 6.0, not 6.7, not 5.8, 5.2. And that's what? Every moment of every day, his blood sugar is like 90, you know? So who's gonna be healthier, uh, blood sugar of 123 all the time or blood sugar of 90? So diet, that's where diet plays a role. Stress, it does, in other words, let's say I have a lot of stress, which I do, right? My associate's gone, so I have to, see her patients, my patients for maybe five months. Um, you know, and plus all the responsibilities making this and other videos. But if you saw me, you'd say, one day at the end of the day, this was last week, I said to the patient, and it was like 5.30, because I'm working like 12 plus hour days. And we're toward the end of the consult. And I said, if you check my pulse right now, it's like 60. And I said, do you, did you feel like I gave you, and it was a couple, I said, do you feel like I gave you like good energy, like the doctor was on and 
you got really good service. She's like, Doc, great service. So I said, think of that. I'm working every day, 12 plus hour days. You're, oh, it was Friday, it was my last patient of the week. My very last patient of the week. And they're like, Doc, no, you have good energy, you have this. I'm almost 60. So it just means that I'm not letting all the awful, the awful is the wrong word. I mean, I'm do, I, obviously I'm happy to do it for Danielle, but I mean, just, I'm not letting my circumstances and woe is me to affect what I do, so I try to come into the office with joy, have joy. Occasionally, even right here, I'll lay down like just for five minutes uh, if I have to, like I'm getting tired. And because of that, the stress isn't negatively affecting me. If I'm like, geez, I'm almost 60 and I gotta work this hard and da-da-da, and -da -da, it's yeah, I'm just gonna make the situation worse, and then stress is gonna affect my vagus nerve. So. Your perception of stress, your diet, blood sugars, and the third most common cause of vagus nerve degeneration is cervical destructure. So in other words, what I think happens is people who have low uh, vagal tone, in other words, their vagus nerves basically are weak or damaged. They're the ones that get a stronger reaction to COVID then they're more prone to getting long haul COVID. And thus the underlying issue really relates to the vagus nerve degeneration, which is the same disease process that leads to high intracranial pressure, which is compression of the jugular vein and the vagus nerve at the atlas, which is what the atlas is too far forward. And that's what damages that's what damages the vagus nerve. For those who aren't familiar with the vagus nerve, just know that the DNA, the ganglion where the DNA of the vagus nerve is, and that's the brains of the vagus nerve, it sits right at the no-dose ganglion, which is right at C1. The vagus nerve is made up of 100,000 individual nerve cells. So as those nerve cells die, the vagus nerve gets smaller. So if your C1 is so far forward, it stretches and damages the vagus nerve every day. Every day you're like this. So in other words, the main sensor for the internal physiology of the body, that sensor is getting damaged. And that's what can cause a lot of human disease. That's what the vagus nerve looks like in the human body. And these are all the things that the vagus nerve senses and tells your brain what's going on with your organ function, what's going on with nerve regeneration, what's going on with immune surveillance, that's all the vagus nerve, what's going on with digestion, right? And the vagus nerve sits right in front of the vertebrae here. And basically the ganglion of the vagus nerve sits right at C1, and that's the jugular foramen that I showed you earlier that the jugular vein goes in. And then the vagus nerve innervates all, all of the uh, internal organs. And it originates in the brain stem, which is just above the atlas also. And this is basically what happens. So the vagus nerve is also called the superhighway or the motor cross of the nervous system. It's the most important nerves in the body, right vagus nerve, left vagus nerve. And basically, when you have cervical destructure or a change in the cervical curve, you end up, it's like a, it's like a congestion on a highway. You know, and then if the nerve impulses don't go through, then the brain doesn't get the information it needs and the brain doesn't know what to do. And then you get digestive problems, autoimmune diseases, lots of anxiety. And this just shows it from the lungs, you know, that the vagus nerve is both the sensor for the lungs and it also is basically, if you have, if you have COVID, the, it, it's basically the vagus nerves that are saying, expel the virus, expel the virus, expel the virus. Okay, and this just again shows that the vagus nerve is in basically the endothelium. In other words, it's the protector of the barrier. It's the nerve impulse to the barrier of the lungs 
barrier of the digestive tract. So if the vagus nerve gets degenerated, the barrier is broken. And of course, if the barrier in the brain's broken, and it's not gonna be good. If the barrier is broken in the lungs, the lungs going to what? Hyper react, right? That's what we had with COVID. Your lungs hyper react, and those were the people that did bad with, uh, had a lot of bad symptoms with COVID. And then if the barrier, the intestinal permeability barrier gets broken in the digestive tract, you get, you get inflammatory bowel disease, you get inflammation in the digestive tract, you get autoimmune disease. And this again, just kind of shows what happens on a microscopic level that when the vagus nerve isn't working right or degenerated, you get all these interleukins and you get you know, cytokine storm or you get systemic inflammation all over the body. And this is from another great article you know, I'll, you guys can research it, but basically long haul COVID, all the different things that happen. So persistent inflammation, uh, reactivation of uh, pathogens. So all this stuff, if you look at all this stuff, you would say that in summary, it's, they're surmising that there's something wrong with the immune system and there's something wrong with the cell. And I'm just saying that the immune system dysregulation can be from vagus nerve degeneration, from cervical destruction, a breakdown of the cervical curve, because it's the vagus nerve that cleans up inflammation. In the human body, what gets rid of inflammation in the body is the vagus nerve. So if you research vagus nerve anti-inflammatory system, lots of stuff will pop up on Google. So if you have vagus nerve degeneration, then you get COVID, you're at risk of getting an accelerated inflammatory response. And of course, that inflammatory response is gonna give you a lot of symptoms. The connection between the vagus nerve and increased intestinal permeability, and that's what I've been talking about, the whole thing that the, the wall, the digestive wall, the mucosa, that the vagus nerve innervates the enteric nervous system. So the vagus nerve is 100,000 neurons. The nervous system in your gut, it's 500 million. So that means every vagus nerve cell innervates something like 5,000 enteric neurons. So if you knock out one vagus neuron, you're like knocking out 5,000 enteric neurons. So of course that can do what? that can cause increased intestinal permeability. And that increased intestinal permeability then can lead to all the findings that we're seeing in long haul COVID where you have increased inflammatory markers in the blood. This just kind of shows that when you stimulate the vagus nerve, so there's vagus nerve st stimulators. So that means anybody with long haul COVID beside uh, checking your heart rate variability. Another thing you can do is get a vagus nerve stimulator. So there's lots of them on the internet. If you innervate the vagus nerve, like in the ear, like the inner ear, because the vagus nerve innervates the canal here, then what happens is with vagus nerve stimulation, it even causes neurogenesis nerve regeneration in the brain. So obviously if vagus nerve stimulation increases vagus, increases nerve regeneration in the brain, it has to be that vagus nerve degeneration can cause degeneration in the brain. So in summary, this is basically what I've been talking about where if, if somebody is somewhat sick, they already start out with increased brain pressure or vagus nerve degeneration, then they get COVID or some kind of a stressor, the depletion they had or the issue they had after the COVID resolves, they still have it, right? They still have it. Where a healthy person who has normal neck function, normal neck structure, good vagus tone, they get sick, they get a little cold, they get sick, they get their health restored. But somebody who's already in a sick state or a not as healthy state, after they're sick, this illness itself is gonna take some of the resources that they didn't have. So now they're at a lower level of health. So it's much easier to get long-term symptoms. So I'm just saying, 
we all got to be treating this part, not way down here that you need a drug to get rid of the inflammation. It may make you feel better, but you're not addressing the actual cause. So what I'm going to do is just talk about a few of the symptoms that people get with long haul COVID and just show how it can be structural. So see this person where the spinal cord is hitting the vertebrae in the back. The posterior column of the spinal cord, that's what nerve impulses that have to do with itching, sensation, vibration, temperature, they go up the track here. So if you have increased pressure on the spinal cord, your temperature regulation can get screwed up. You're itching, you could have all kinds of itching. You could have a numb feeling, or you could have creepy crawlies or numbness or zapping in your body, and it could be coming from the neck because those nerve impulses travel up the neck. So this again just shows many people have just their spinal cords get just getting crushed. You can see the spinal cords getting crushed. And then here you see this is cerebral spinal fluid. Remember I said that when you have accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid, you can get flattening of the pons. That's here. The pons is where all the relay center are. Not just the pons, but the brainstem, the respiratory center, blood pressure center, autonomic nervous system center. So obviously if there's increased pressure, then you can have temperature dysregulation, nausea, the nausea centers there, the breathing centers there, you could have shortness of breath or all kinds of breathing. And this just shows that when there's excessive movement of the bones or the bones are in the wrong position, it can irritate the spinal cord and the nerves. And again, this is how it should look, but you would see where this one has cerebral spinal fluid around it where there, there's no cerebral spinal fluid, so you're getting tension on the spinal cord. And depending on where the tension is on the spinal cord, it can affect the muscles, it can affect temperature, it can affect pain. So people who have like pain all over their bodies, it definitely can be just from uh, the breakdown of the cervical curve causing tension on the spinal cord, and that's why they have pain all over their bodies the neck, the, the tracks in the neck, the spinal cord tracks can affect the coordination, be the head and the eyes. So if those reflexes are not optimal, people can get dizziness. They can feel like the things are moving even though they're not moving. And again, uh, this is from neurologic consequences of COVID and all the things that occurs in the human body and especially the brain. Like you can get all kinds of things in the brain, neuroinflammation, it can disrupt nerve tracts. And I'm just saying that there could be something directly on the brain affecting uh, the brain from post COVID, but it may be that all these things are actually secondary to a structural problem in the neck. And then when we x-ray people in the office, this is basically what we see. Like instead of that beautiful cervical curve, we see all kinds of craziness like here. So this is a person that had reversal of the cervical curve. And that of course is going to cause obstruction of the uh, obstruction of the uh, jugular vein can affect the nodose ganglion of the vagus and even the carotid artery. But see how the vagus nerve and the jugular vein go through the same hole into the brain. And basically this gets occluded. Then the brain pressure increases. When the brain pressure increases, this shows just extra fluid hitting the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is where you get all kinds of higher cognitive functioning. So if you feel like your brain just isn't working right, it's probably this mechanism that you have high brain pressure. And my recommendation is to get checked out to see whether you know you have indications of high brain pressure. If you can't come here, at minimum, I'd say get a, get a lateral C-spine x-ray, check your vagal tone by uh, heart rate variability monitor, get your monitor up, stop looking at your cell phone, you yourself correct your curve and then that may restore the uh, fluid flow out of the brain which would reduce the pressure and you would again of course feel great. So 
This is basically how brain symptoms progress when somebody has uh, normal uh, brain pressures and as the brain pressure goes up, you just start getting more and more severe brain symptoms, including where you get depression, lethargy, hopelessness, and eventually dissociation where you just don't feel like yourself. And in our office, what we found is as we restore the brain function by getting the cervical curve back to normal, vagal function back to normal, these symptoms gradually resolve. And if you don't do something and the brain pressure keeps increasing, eventually, and brain toxicity keeps increasing, eventually you're gonna get a brain cell death. And if enough cells die, we call that uh, cortex atrophy or brain atrophy. And it's amazing now, because people often see me um, after they've seen a lot of doctors. So I started my medical training in the VA, and I'm just telling you, in the VA, at Heinz VA, and I got great education from 88 to 92, so I took care of veterans for four years. And almost all their brain MRIs showed, they, it showed white matter lesions, which the radiologists would say, so in their cortex of their brain, the cortex of the brain, though, um, uh, not the inside of the brain, the outside of the brain, the cortex, the MRI would show that there was lesions, these white matter lesions, that meant that they had small vessel disease. Like in other words, they had a little bit of coagulopathy and then didn't cause a lot of things, but it did show that there is some brain damage occurring a little bit. Do you know in my office now that I'm seeing uh, people in their 30s with those same things that the veterans who were under so much stress from the war and all kinds of things that would get in their 70s, I'm seeing it in the 30s. So this stuff is real, this stuff is serious. Uh, my advice is don't just take for granted that you got some organism disease and then you gotta be on medications for, the, for years. My advice is if you have a structural issue, just treat the structural issue because once the structural issue is resolved, whatever symptoms are from that are gonna go away. And what if all your symptoms are from a structural issue? Or you need the structural issue resolved to strengthen your immune system so you can get resolution of the infection issue. So this just shows how breakdown of the cervical curve can lead to, to a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, leads to inflammatory substances getting into the brain, which causes the neuroinflammation. So the scientists who show that there's neuroinflammation, I'm just saying the it could be that it's this process that leads to that, not necessarily that it was from COVID itself. So cervical curve correction and prolotherapy, it basically reestablishes the normal biomechanics like lordosis. Prolotherapy is a regenerative injection treatment that causes the thickening, tightening of ligaments to resolve joint instability. So the way we document the joint instability is by motion x-ray called digital motion x-ray. And then after a few visits, we recheck the person to see that it resolves. So we have objective evidence that the that it resolves and the combination of it normally helps the person's physiology get back to normal. So you might say, well, how do you check that? Well, I told you on the initial visit, we'll do things such as optic nerve sheath diameter. We'll check the vagus nerve diameter, the blood flow into and out of the brain. We'll check the jugular vein dimensions. So sometime in the course of treatment after a few visits, We'll recheck that to make sure their jugular veins are opening, the vagus nerves are getting bigger, and then once that happens, then their symptoms uh, start to remit. So appreciate you guys. I know it's a long video, but I hope it's been helpful. And most of all, I just wanna wish you the best of health.